Guten Tag, bonjour, buenos dias, good day, big interview listeners. You've been very good. You've been very patient. So here it is, part two of our big interview with Terry Gibson. It's been worth the wait, I promise you. That's what you'll see at the end of listening to this. If you remember, at the end of part one, we left our Terry after he'd cut short an unfulfilling spell at Manchester United and then signed for Wimbledon. We're going to pick up the story there. As Tell takes you inside that club and introduces you to the crazy gang. All right, the chances are you'll have heard of them. But Terry Gibson takes us beyond the headlines and describes a group of rival factions who shared a successful dressing room. It's fascinating stuff, but there's a happy ending too, with Wimbledon going on to lift the 1988 FA Cup. Spoiler alert, yeah, they won the final. Terry talks brilliantly about that cup run and the final, the historic final against Liverpool. Whenever I get the chance, I enjoy speaking to Terry and I consider him a friend. But that's not the simple reason that I wanted him on the show. Terry also has a shrewd, fantastically analytical football mind. Just listen to how he takes clubs in England to task over their reliance on financial might instead of effective scouting. Take it away, Terry Gibson. The FA Cup was a thing, wasn't it? Massive. But you because know, of that game we talked about earlier against United. Yeah. My second and third games as a professional in the FA Cup. Glamorous FA Cup because games. Because bloody Steve Archibald, the chum of mine and Gareth Crooks, so I don't know, were keeping you out there. And Ricky was waltzing around half the Manchester City exactly, team when yeah. you were on the books. I was on the books. I had one of the cup finals. I was out on loan in Sweden. But I was around the Chas and Dave era and the excitement that generated the FA Cup in general. But at Spurs for two years on the trot, the queues around the block to get tickets for the rounds, the semi-final, with neutral venue. The double's called the double for uh, a reason. Yeah, and it was... Your dad's it, hero I, I was, won the cup and the exactly. league cup. Exactly. So it, it was... I, I left Coventry and they won it. The season after. Dave Bennett, no? Dave Bennett, yeah. Dave the six Bennett. months before that was I was Keith Alchin. And then I'm um, watching it, not playing at Man United. We was in Malta at the time, watching the cup final and the end of the season to watching it and it's Coventry against Spurs, both my old clubs. And I wasn't getting a game at Old Trafford, so I thought no. So but listen, it was the furthest thing in my mind when I joined Wimbledon. So it wasn't the master plan. I know. If I joined Wimbledon We'll probably win the FA Cup. Yeah. I'll give up. No, I, I didn't think Master it was plan, no. no. No, I thought it was long gone. I thought, with, you know, I left Coventry and they've won it. I was at Spurs and they won it twice. When I met United, it's my two old clubs playing in the final. No, I, I didn't go to Wimbledon thinking. None of, there was no bonus for an FA Cup win with Wimbledon Football Club. None of us could, signed could it. Nobody thought it was... It was like giving someone a bonus... I'll tell you what it was like, Tell. It was it's like your story. The luxury ticket. It was like sitting down with Leicester and negotiating Claudio Ranieri's contract. Exactly. And they say, what would you like for avoiding relegation? And what would like, you know, right? Yes. That, and, and, yeah. and seventh, uh, right, okay, seventh. And then the agent, hello, Steve, says, um, and sixth and fifth. Yeah. And the owners exactly. fall about laughing and, the, yeah. and they go, and he goes first and they go, write your own check. Yeah. And, and the, exactly. And he, and he so much trouble though, it did. Mm. That there was no bonus. Yeah, I bet you. Because when we got there, it was like, oh, Alan, we ain't got a bonus. We got parents' money, no bonus. Well, when you say when you got there, you mean Wembley? Yeah. And everybody went, oh, I don't want that contract yeah. now. I don't want yeah, that. It was, it was, it but you were with the group of really sort of happy-go-lucky, easy-going fellas who wouldn't have taken offence at that kind of... <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it, but it was totally different to anywhere else. I mean, the training ground, the Bob took, didn't take me to Plough Lane or the training ground because he didn't want me to see them he thought it would put you off. So he met me in a pub in Wimbledon Village, which was really nice. And then I agreed <laughs> and then went to Plough Lane and there's a portal <laughs> cabin. And then there's the training ground, which was a transport calf for lorry drivers and school playing fields. So on one day, and the same day, we would have our canteen. It wasn't our canteen, it was a canteen that was filled with transport drivers and changing rooms next door to school children getting changed and using our pitches and we were having to clear up the mess that was there on the Saturday and Sunday from the Saturday and Sunday morning teams that played. And lest anybody forget, we're talking about Wimbledon in the division that is, is now the Premier League. This is a Wimbledon top, Premier League. Top seven, top eight, regular. And yet these were your facilities. Incredible, yeah. Buy your so own that... boots, make your own way to games, drive your own car to FA Cup semi-final. No, I didn't Park know that. in the street. No. No team bus. There was a mini bus with a kit on. No, actually, it was a Range Rover. 
What? The, yeah, the kit man had a Range Rover <laughs> and the skip was in the back of his car with Bobby Gould. And he turned up at White Hart Lane and they said, no, you can't come in here. This is for the team bus. And he said, this is, this is the kit, this is the team bus. The rest are all parking up the street, making their own way here, which was the norm for the London games. You've, you've lived every shade of the colour of the football rainbow, haven't you? Exactly, yeah. I mean, it, was, it, was, it never bothered me until that game. And then all of a sudden I'm stuck in traffic down the A10, going to my old club, Tottenham. It was White Hart Lane. In very common, you're your home and, ground. So I'm now like, I think, oh, this is it. Like, it, it. I hadn't slept for about a week. Playing in the FA Cup semi-final. Built up, tell the audience to play whom? <laughs> Eventually played Liverpool. We're playing Luton. At but the White semi-final Hart is... At White Hart Lane. Yeah, against Luton. Against Luton. Who were near us in the league. Mm. Good team, England international players. And I'm thinking, what happens if Dave Besson breaks down? Mm. What? Well, I didn't even know our reserve. We never had a second-choice goalkeeper. I have no idea who our... We're now in a completely cover un- unknown territory was, because we were talking about this. You're serious? Dave never missed a game in the whole time he was at Wimbledon for about 10 years. You're ago, telling me. Yeah? And we never had a, we that, never had a transport car goalkeeper. Or in a school playing It was a young field. kid. I think it was Simon Tracy, who was a youth team goalkeeper. Hi, Simon, if you're listening. Yeah, because uh, Simon played the but year on the day after. you wouldn't have been sure if he'd, been, if he'd made it, if he'd been told I, to I be don't there. Think, or... knew, I don't think he would have been told. To, he would have been 17, 18 years old and... But there was no second choice cover goalkeeper. We never needed one. They never missed a game, and then there we. It was, but luckily, we all arrived on time and found the parking space. You're still close to some of the people um, that you knew then. But you've told me, you know, when we've sat down for a glass of wine or, or chatted, you know, on the phone about it, it, you know this myth about the crazy gang and every in it together. That wasn't true then and ain't true now. But there were spells when two of the more famous ones. Were you you ran with a little bit at least with Dennis and, and Vinny. You had either respect for them or you, or you because you in your in your fabulous book that you know you wrote and published. You talk about you use a phrase well nobody got caused more scrapes than than me and Dennis. Not, so Dennis Wise would have been famous for that and me and Vinny Jones doing whatever Vinny Jones did, and we're coming to that in a second. But you. You ran with that section of the gang. You were comfortable in that section of the gang. To a degree. There was a lot of stuff that went on. I, I like a mess and joke and laugh around as much as the others and pranks and stuff like that. But there was times where it was a little bit embarrassing going into standing in the tunnels and renting and raving with other players and the stuff, some of the stuff that was said in the press. And, and then it became... When I joined the club, it was fun, and within a short space of time, it became publicity fed. You know, it was done for the wrong reasons. The crazy gang that I joined, the actual original crazy gang, was still there, mm. but they weren't playing anymore. Mm. Anymore, they'd been replaced by the younger crazy gang, Vinny, Dennis Wise, but the, the likes of Corky, Dave Besson, Laurie Sanchez were still around. Then we had people like Wally Downs. The guys that I'm talking Steve about, you'd still Gallias. be quite close with today, most yeah. of them. And there was Wally Downs, Stevie Galliers, Paul Fishenden, Mark Morris, Kevin Gage, Glyn Hodges. They were the ones that before us. Then I kind of felt it was kind of false a little bit mm. from my group. Kind of playing up to the image or, yes. or using the, the image for image. Per- personal yes. and, and profile. And once they realised they could get on the back pages by saying stuff that wasn't true, but it was silly enough to, it was, you know, the press gobbled it up. Um, so there was sometimes something would be in the press the day before a game. You think, oh, really? I think Vinnie threatened to rip Dalglish's head off, didn't he? And for the cup final, went down the hole. I think that was a normal game. That wasn't. Oh, was that? Sorry. Was just another, yeah, it was which just, led to the. That he got a massive ban and. Stuff and it led like that, to before the final, certain people saying, "Well, we hope Liverpool beat them, put them in their yeah, place." I, and, can't, I get that. I understand that. Yeah. It annoys me now when I see here that everyone wanted us to win. They didn't. No. Everyone wanted Liverpool to win. It, clearly. For the good of football, the headlines, that was the headline in one paper. For the good of football, please let Liverpool but let's embarrass reel, us. Let's reel back, because the actual truth is, as I understand it, most of you from sometimes listening to other people who were around that year, but listening to you too, you know, some of it was true in that, you know, Vinny in his moments could lose the place, could be threatening, could be oh, God, yeah, violent. Very, yeah, 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 and, and yeah, to the extent a, that the, the he could have been dangerous to be around. Lit. Yeah. My way of defining how it worked at Wimbledon was that not everybody got on. We wasn't a social crowd. No. 
there was little clicks. There was the old, there was the new, there was the very old that didn't like the new old. It was kind of weird, you know, <laughs> sort of thing. Like, as I said earlier, the cool kids and Sanch and Dave Besson and those players didn't really like the idea of what Vinny and Fash were trying to do and Dennis Wise. And then we had the new lot that they didn't particularly like because we replaced the old lot that left had gone with Dave Bassett. So there was, a, there was a, a really uncomfortable period for that first season, building up to that cup final. And so there was no social life. Mm. We lived in different parts of the south-east, really. I mean, mm. there was players out in Reading, out in Essex. No one could afford to live in Wimbledon. Mm. Um, one or two lived more sort of London side, Tooting and Mitchum, that place. But as you've already no said, no, so you're all travelling separately. So we train, yeah, you it's might have a click where three day. or four came in from one area, two or three came in from another area, but it, there was no nights out, like a much better social life at Man United, for instance. Yeah. There was a cracking social life if, if you wanted it at Man United. As we've established. As you expect. But there wasn't that at Wimbledon. But when I found, when I played, take the, the court, I think it was quarter final, for instance, against Watford. Brian Gale was playing, he, he punches, I think it's Malcolm Allen in the face. No reason, there's no build-up to it. Uh, I don't know what is, what's happened. Ridiculous scenario. Red carded, we're one nil down. So we've now got, I think, probably half an hour. Mm. We're down at ten men, we're one nil down. Everything's built around Wimbledon that year, getting to the cup final. Mm. And you we just come put back all and win 2 one. Because of what, talent? No, no, will? no, we'll... And that togetherness that didn't exist outside of that ah, football pitch. The pitch, right, sorry, I get you. So everything was together. It didn't bother me when we... Yeah, I was cheesed off that we'd gone down to 10 men, but I never for one second thought, that's just done. Mm. I still genuinely believed that we would at least get a draw. We wouldn't be knocked out that day. Our destiny was going to be the cup final. You talked to we don't get beat by teams like Watford. Well, you talked about the sandwich of... One nil down, two one up against Watford. Probably Graham Taylor's Watford, I imagine. Possibly, yeah. That's my guess. Yeah. Winning uh, against Luton no. in the semi final. Yeah, it would have been because I nearly went to Watford. Yeah, yeah, from United. But it's that sandwiches before we get to Liverpool in the final. That sandwich is, I think, the one that's iconic, most famous. No, which is when the reason I was thinking about Vinny is that by your Newcastle. testimony, it's Newcastle, and everyone just thinks of this mad photo of Vinny yeah. kind of looking impish. Kind of at the camera and, and Gaza going, hold on, he's, he's playing with Magoolies. Yeah. But your uh, description, witness testimony of that match is that it was, you know, it was really violent that for 45 minutes, 50 minutes, Vinny's, you know, lost the place and, and it ends up costing you at yeah, half time. But and 24 am hours. I right in that description? Yeah, 24 hours Vinny was in a lost place because this was a league game a week before the cup match and we're playing at Plough Lane. And Don Howe and Bobby Gould came up with this idea in training that Vinny was going to man-to-man mark Paul Gascoigne. So we're playing a training game on the Friday morning and a player called Vaughan Ryan, who's a really talented youngster, been on to play a number of games for Wimbledon, was going to be Paul Gascoigne be Gaza, right. okay. in the reserves. And he run the show and Vinny didn't go anywhere near him. Vinny was doing his own thing. He wasn't listening to Don and wasn't ah. listening to Bobby Gould. And Don and in front of everyone, Don and Bobby Gould absolutely annihilated him out on the training pitch. Annihilated um, Vinnie Jones? Yeah. So he had an anger then that continued until three o'clock on Saturday afternoon when Gazza walked into Plough Lane and from the first minute on, Vinnie just let rip. It was quite funny, actually, because it was silly things. Like, you could hear it. We could hear it. And Gazza was giving as good as he could back. It wasn't jovial, it was sledging that Vinny would take our throws. The only time he left Gazza to take a long throw, and he'd say, you fat boy, you stay there till I come back, and Gazza giving him some back. It was aggressive, but it, it was, if you're a bystander and you're not, it's quite funny. Gazza can give it back, so Vinny would go and take his long throw and then find Gazza again and just obsessively chase him around the pitch all the time. And then at half-time, Vinny's pumped up, he's we come down the tunnel at half time and at Plough Lane, it was single file. You couldn't go, oh. it was so small. Brick wall, it was like the ball court, the tiny, minute version of the ball court at White Hart Lane. So you're walking down this tiny little concrete floor that's been painted. Your studs are slipping on it if you're not careful. At the end of it, there's a dead end. Left is their change room, right is ours. Straight in front is a brick wall. And Vinny slammed him into the 
brick wall. Something was said, they were having a pop at each other. Gazza was in front, Vinny was behind them, Vinny slammed him into the brick wall. And I, I wasn't alone, but I was the first, I was right behind them. So I jumped in and pushed Vinny out of the way. One of the Newcastle players got Gazza and took him the other way. And then Vinny went absolutely berserk about not touching him, don't go against the pack and all that rubbish. And, and it ended up a fisty cuffs between us two. And then Bobby Gould said, I know what you're like, who's blaming me? So he said, I know what you're like. He took us both in the shower area, which again is concrete floor. We've got aluminium studs on. Bambi Gouldies, on ice. Gouldies, yeah, Gouldies had a pop. The three of us have ended up in a big pile up on the floor and people dragging us off. And I actually didn't want to go out for the second half. It was the only time I thought, no, sod this. I'm not because of a sense be... of injustice. Vinny's out of order. Gouldies out of order. Um, and I, I just didn't feel the need to go out and play again the second half. The, I, so it, that was me. I, I, at that time, I Don had a word with me. Don Howe, do your job, get out. We look into it afterwards. Good man, Don. Shrewd man. Oh yeah, good, I was good a football. Real man. privilege to good football been man. Great Don. man. Yeah. I wasn't in I love agree. with the idea when I joined, and Don was there because I knew the reputation. But he I, shocked he me when I got to know. Brilliant too. player, a brilliant person, brilliant coach. Yeah. Takes a lot of credit for us winning the FA Cup. Fabulous football Bob mind. should because he gave Don. Yeah, it was a great partnership. Yeah. Bob did all the off the field work. All Don had to do was come in and control and coach this bunch of Herberts on a daily basis and, and make things things run smoothly. So, so I went home afterwards. I I blow my face. Vinny had one on his face. Gordy had one on his face, and I was still getting the blame, and it, it, it pissed me off. And then there was a, an inquest and they found out. That, and actually, Vinny that night rang me at home. I think he came clean about it was nothing. Gibbo was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Steam came out of his ears and he just saw yeah. red. So, yeah, that, that kind of resolved itself in the end. But but it's Newcastle around the corner almost immediately. Yeah, and then I'd go in training on the Monday and Fash is then telling me the same things as Vinny said. Don't go against the pack. The players are not we, happy. We've got this. Absolutely. So yeah. I, was, I was, again, I thought, I haven't been here long. Is this true? I clearly didn't know Fash that well then. It wasn't. It was Idiot. absolute nonsense. Yeah. But then a week later, we got Newcastle in the FA Cup. After all this, the pictures have been everywhere in the paper. And that player lane, it was only me that could hear Vinny saying, fat boy, stay there. I mean, it's the tiniest <laughs> ground going. The supporters could hear it. So reporters could hear it sitting in the stand. And it was a. It, so everything was built up. And we had. There was talk of death threats. I'm not sure how they materialised that. Women at that time, I'm sure it was part of the, the whole publicity process to build up the profile of Vinny, the profile of the game. It was, oh, if Vinny would be daft enough to have said, I've had death threats, you know, how, where, from, uh, yeah. And, um, Jimmy Five Bellies. Yeah. And, it, and it, we went up there and it was, that was intimidating with the atmosphere in Newcastle. We were, we were like, there was, what, 13 players. Backroom staff are probably looking at 20 people going up to the North East against the, the, the whole of Newcastle. But you win it and... Won it easily. Yeah. You played better than the week before. Yeah. Vinny didn't even have to mark Gazza. There was a different tactic. I can't remember exactly what it was. It was more zonal. Um, we played slightly different. I think, and, and we won it we comfortably. And vaulting we over... an early lead and, and give them a... Real good going on. Vaulting over Luton leaves you where you wanted to be, which is the cup final, which is... And a little bit on that one, if you don't mind. We had the whole of Newcastle against us. We raced into an early lead, dominated the game, I think it was 3-1 in the end. And Mirandinha, do you remember the Brazilian? Yeah. He was pissed off because it was his dream. A bit like Ozzy and Ricky to come and play in a cup final, I play bet. at Wembley. And he, was and he was a fair footballer too. Great, yeah, really good player. And as, as we're finishing the game, one... Um, the stand behind the goal, we were in temporary change rooms in port cabins because there was building work going on. Okay. So it, it was not the old stadiums, I think it would be on the goal. Yeah. And as we're walking off, we're shaking hands, there are 50 odd thousand Geordies are pissed off because we've knocked them out and they thought they were going to have a really good cup run. And then I see Marindini run towards Dave Besant from behind and he jumps up and Kung Fu kicks him. <laughs> <laughs> right at the back of the neck, well, well, which is some doing Mar when Dave Besson is a big lad. Yeah, Mirandino's not so, by no, it's, no it's means a big fella. It's a typical old jump up and whack right across the Whoa. back of Dave Besson. So I've seen it. I've, I've just turned around and we're shaking hands with one or two people and, and I see it and I chase him. And then 
So I'm chasing him now. The goals. Wait, 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 wait. No, it's no, a week. Is, it's a week turn. since you've got to the point of almost walking out at halftime because you just because you've stepped in yeah. and you've learned you're I'm not at all. Right, a week later, you're chasing right, him. Wrong. And that was, Vinny was wrong. Mirandini was wrong. So I'm chasing <laughs> him, and other people, have, other ones of us, the Terry the other players have seen us, me chasing him. Led the chase. They've joined in on the chase. So he's running towards temporary port cabins. Are behind the goal that we're all walking towards. So all these people, not what you see, two and three hundred people now in a Premier League walking towards a tunnel. It's like thirty people. So we're all walking towards this tunnel, and then I'm chasing him the other direction. So. He's running towards the other goal at the other end, away from me and four or five others. At in, into an foot. empty half of the into pitch. Into an empty half of the pitch. Then he bends his run and he runs <laughs> down. He runs, you can't be upset. No, when you've it come gets, to uh, wait till it ends up. He bends <laughs> he his run bends his and I'm getting run. closer. And I'm, I'm <laughs> him down. He jumps around the halfway line into the crowd <laughs> and doesn't come back out. So he makes his way from the crowd <laughs> down into the in his kit into the port cabin no he sneaks off round right amongst the fans must do they must help him get back <laughs> somehow um, there was four or five chasing him at that Why stage I? and then we he he comes in the changing room after in his suit and everything to apologise Bunch of flowers. <laughs> he's got a bunch of Where's flowers. He got a bunch and of he's flowers? saying, maybe that is he's nicked off from when he bends no, his run. Yeah, and I've, we've, he's got no, we've got no idea what he's saying. He's he's with a, an official interpreter who's saying Mirandina would like this is him with the crazy gang. Well, he's actually Portuguese. He's actually, going we're going to. I'll do it the next time as well. He's he doing right to up, play yeah. at Wembley, and he says something in in his yeah, language, yeah. and then it's interpreted. And we we all think, yeah, I've been saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and then he's really upset. He wants to wish you this and wish you that. Take these Can you forgive you him? Take your, yeah. And then Vinny goes and gets a toilet brush <laughs> and gives him the toilet brush. Take they do a swap. So that was that was the new, and and to be honest, that was that one game turned the whole season round in terms of the togetherness. Do you know what I mean? There was an old old yeah. Corky in that lot. Yeah. There was an old new of fashion Vinny in that new little game. Yeah. And then there was me, Eric Young, Clive Goodyear, John Scales, Terry Phelan. So it was like three groups and it and that one game it, it all came on the way home, whether it was me chasing Mirandini and I don't know who else was backing me up, it was the whole like we were gonna go all the way now. And that was the cup lift began with the kung fu kick and you chasing the assaulter. And probably it began the day bef- the day before against the league match where Vinny lost didn't do his job and got slaughtered. Then for lost his temper against Gaza in the first game to the pressure going into the second game and then it's funny so what it was a two week period. Planned, isn't it? It's funny the things that you know. This is yeah. If you if you stop coming think- up on that train that night from Newcastle, all of us were together. Bob, Don. All the players, there was no group over there, group over you there. You knew that then, or you we were coming up with new nicknames for each other. Oh, yeah? Yeah, there was new nicknames. I called Clive Goodyear Wing Commander because he had the little moustache. <laughs> to this day, he's still called Wing Co. And it was up until that point, no one gave a monkey's whether they spoke to Clive. Scalzi got bullied, Terry Phelan got bullied, Eric Young got away with it because he was six foot oh, four. I was going to say, he no wouldn't get bully bullied. Him. But there was. And that game was the one where it all, all come together. And even before that game, that week, we'd gone away for the week before. We'd had like World War Three in Spain with fascist mob against the other mob in eight sides trying to kill each other. And Laurie Cunningham in the middle going, what am I doing, what am I doing here? Everyone taking each other out. with Laurie on loan from Man United or... On loan from Madrid? No. He was not on loan from anywhere. He was without a club. Signed by Wimbledon. Yeah, we had Colton Fairweather broke his leg in the one of the early cup rounds and he was an important player, Colton. We never had a, an obvious replacement, so Laurie came in. Sensational footballer. And not, I'm saying Laurie is an obvious replacement for anybody at Wimbledon. I still laugh now when I hear of the noise when Laurie did a square pass across the halfway line with the outside of his foot. That was... It was like everybody... I'd had it when I joined. and Don't, don't pass square. Yeah, it was like seven plays. Put it along. Yeah. Oh, it never went sideways. No sideways passes. It was forward or back. And did he sort of jump out of his skin, Laurie, when it, he no, was no, like... Yeah, no, it, 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 it didn't face him. But, but it was funny when he come on and everyone's running forward or looking forward and he passes it square and everyone's like, what the... What's he doing? No one... Get it forward in the channel. 
Um, and where did you go to Spain? Where, where's the Third World War take place? But you got a training camp or what, what? Training camp, just everybody at war. There was two groups, and it was it was the Juju Band group against the non Juju Band group. Now the Juju Band was these bracelet things that Fash had that he was giving to players. That it was part of a gang thing. It was so childish. It was ridiculous. So we had the Wisey. The, the two groups I was talking about split playing against each other every day and it was no no we're telling Bob and Don we're playing again tomorrow and it was every day it was called off halfway through because too dangerous was, yeah did you cope or were you sick of it or was did you did you kind of go like, yeah I'm going to take my share of prisoners or what, what, oh no you, no you had what, to cope yeah the only one that didn't was Laurie just Laurie Cunningham just stood out and thought, let him get on with it I'm not <laughs> Too late in my career that we never did this at Real Madrid, and I'm not getting involved in this. And it never carried over into the bar at night with it, with a couple of drinks taken and. No, no, it'd be carried over to the extent they would eat there, and we'd eat, eat there, and it was it was totally divided bonkers, at meals. Totally times. divided, yeah, and totally divided the whole the whole time, and then that one game at Newcastle, on the way back on the train, I remember sitting there thinking, I wouldn't have thought this was possible three days ago. It's really extraordinary, the things that come yeah. together in, know, it, in, a, in, a, in the Listen, human psychology of a group exactly. of hard nuts. And all these courses you go on for coaching badges and stuff yeah. like that, and they take, <laughs> just, try and yeah. get a coaching course that <laughs> do you start dealing with that mob. And then, and then on the way home, it kicked off on the aeroplane, and people were getting hit with our missiles on the aeroplane that were nothing. To, we were on a normal scheduled flight, and a can of beer got thrown 12 seats down the front. From one player to another that hit someone else. With the beer in it or...? Uh, Not a lot of beer in it, no. By the time it come out, by the time it reached... If they hit a punter, it, it, it was... Oh, yeah, and Don went berserk. Don saw who did it and, and Don Nick wheeled in the next day for team So meeting. having won the cup, Eventually. in inverted commas, in, yeah. in, against Newcastle and in the Third World War, how did you actually win the cup? Because the, I, I think, I genuinely... I'm trying to pinpoint... Like everybody knows, listen to this, that you're... Terry Gibson FA Cup winner. Mm-hmm. Probably some don't know that you're Terry Gibson European Championship winner for England. Yeah, as a youngster, yeah. Under 18. But we'll touch on that. But still, even though they know you're an FA Cup winner, they don't know the ludicrous personal situation that you were in to be able to turn out at Wembley on that blazing hot day against Liverpool. And I think it's worth explaining because I think it's people don't know the struggles that players have or the risks they take, or sometimes what they're willing to do to achieve their personal moment of glory. And in this instance, this interview, that applies to you. Do you know, I fractured my pelvis when I was 14 and played within six weeks because we had a cup final. I was nothing there. I had this Oscar Slattis disease when I was at Spurs and took no time off at all. So you, you kind of become accustomed to, if I can, I will, which has massively changed now. Whereas, you know, they're finely tuned too finely tuned. Mm-hmm. And, and I remember seeing the growing up and seeing kid, uh, older players having injections in their knees and their feet mm-hmm. and their uh, I had injections in my groins and my ribs and ankles and because it was you it was expected of you to do it and also you, you didn't want to miss a game. You mm-hmm. wanted to play. So that season that we're talking about the FA Cup, I actually had a hernia. So I missed the first two rounds. I had what was known as a Gilmore's groin. I was one of the first to have it well done. I was this continuous pain in my groin and hip and lower back that no one had ever really identified what it was and it, 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 it was a kind of hernia and he, he would stick his finger in through the skin and find the tear and you'd hit the roof with pain and he would do something it was Otis Gilmore is his name and he'd become famous for carrying out all these surgeries that players in the past had suffered there was no real sort of cure for it. So I was lucky that there was someone around that knew what the problem was. Mm. So I had that done. There was no rehabilitation done at the clubs. You remember I mentioned earlier about United? So Lillyshaw, do you remember yeah. Lillyshaw came up with yeah. that idea of there was no rehabilitation for long-term injured players or even short, medium, long-term. So you would go residential at Lillyshaw. We had the, the staff there and the facilities there. Because clubs weren't interested in you if you were out for six months because there was one physio that looked after all the players at the club, did all the strappings, all the treatment, so you would be neglected. 
So you would go together to Lily Shaw and train there and mm. a group of like-minded people that are the injured, fighting their way back. I remember doing a circuit there after my hernia and I felt the other side tear. I literally heard it tear. Yeah. I was doing an exercise on the wall bars, lifting your legs up and down the strength. Of, and I heard, I literally, it was like a piece of paper. And I thought, surely that's not it again, but it's the, the other, other side. side. And part of it was the learning process about that particular injury was the other side compensates yeah. and it more often than not, that's going to tear. So I thought, oh, no. So I came back and spoke to the club and they said, no, it can't have, it can't have happened. Started training, still feeling the pain. And then we, got to, we came to an arrangement that I would play whilst we were still in the FA Cup. So I wouldn't train, I would play and then recover. No, recovery was just, I was doing what I criticised the Man United players. There was no, they would, I would have to drive into Wimbledon and have a bath hmm. in an old tin bath. I got one at home, but it, it was a real, real thing in, back in the day that coming for a bath, sometimes you drive two hours to go and have a bath when you got one. At, anyway, so there was no you weren't physio, training. I wasn't training, I couldn't jog. Towards the end of the week, I could jog in straight lines, but I couldn't sprint round corners or go fast round corners. I wore these ridiculous neoprene thick shorts under my mat shorts when I was playing. Kind of like a, a groin corset or a hernia exactly, corset. Exactly, exactly what it was. To hold it in. Yeah, and then we got through one round and then the next round and the next round. And So I, I'd probably done that early March, I'd probably say, from March till May. I barely trained because if I trained, it would hurt for two or three days. So I would play then hurt for two or three days and recover and then play again in the next game. So, And what made it worse, I actually picked up a medial knee ligament injury as well. So if you look in the semi-final, I've got a strap in around my knee and that's to hold the joint together. And then six days before the final, I th- I'm pretty sure I broke my, what is now known as metatarsal, but it used to be just the bone in the top of your foot that I kicked through the bottom of Paul McGrath's boot You're playing at United, Old Trafford yeah. six days before the final. I'd scored um, and then... Had another shot, Paul's blocked the shot, and I've hit the bottom of his boot. I can't get my boot on 24 hours before the cup final because it's swollen. So I slept when I did get it on with my boot on. Couldn't in a situation shoes, like couldn't that, get shoes on. when you can't get your shoes on, your foot's really sore. Yeah. And one of the things you should never do is go to the pub. So luckily you, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no. What? I didn't drink though. What? <laughs> you did no, go to the we pub trained, the it, night before in, the FA Cup final, in, right? And also, we trained for three hours that night before the cup final. <laughs> so when people say what makes the spirit, it wasn't hard, it wasn't intense, it wasn't physical. It's we still trained three hours. for three hours on set pieces. Okay. We did normal training and we're doing this and we're making sure everything's pinned down defensively, still a, 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 attackingly, a, still a at the public ground. training ground uh, where everyone's watching. Could, could anyone watch. There's no way you can stop anyone watching that mm. training session, but no one did. Um, and... We trained for three hours, specifically on defending set pieces, attacking set pieces. The amount of detail that went in and the amount of hard work that went in, the amount of fitness training that went in. Not to my liking, because I woke up on a Saturday at Wimbledon, some games knackered, tired from a week's training, as opposed to feeling on top of the world at Spurs when we had the sharp, quick stuff, the skills, the the kick up on the Friday. Sometimes it was that hard. We would do long distance running and we would do unnecessary box to non-specific fitness training for footballers it was just grueling day in day out on a heavy pitch by the time it comes saturday i woke up saturday thinking i feel like i've played mm. already let alone feeling at my best feeling sharp but the, the attention to detail the hard work the preparation the professionalism i've been nowhere better than at wimbledon mm. in that everybody knew their jobs you got sick to death of the training sessions the the, the routines the repetitiveness of the each day, 11 aside every day, hated it. You know, long distance running after 11 aside, hated it. But I quite liked that we were winning games of football, not getting beat, and ultimately winning a trophy. So people ask me, what, how did that work out? They all think we're a bunch of Herberts that had a laugh and a joke and found their way into an FA Cup final. It was, the mo- it was one... It, Arguably the most professional group of players that I've worked with, with the man, with the right manager and the right coach. You, you substitute and everything was, you said, and it's Atletico Madrid. Yeah, exactly. It's oh, very we, best. Uh, we, we believe at Wimbledon we invented the channel ball, the in-swinging free kick. 
before we did it, no one did an in-swinging free kick. It ends up winning us the FA Cup final. The diving header, we invented that. <laughs> um, uh, the goalkeeper dribbling out, mm. near enough, as far as they'd let him. To, to, to gain some territory so that the ball goes... He was best was pinging it in the 18-yard box from 15 yards. So all the, all the things that are detrimental to football in general. Well, if I was an outsider, I'd be looking at it and thinking, why do you claim credit for that? But it was literally something different, something that came from Dave Bassett that was moved on, that Don Howe and Bobby Gould progressed with, to being so organised. The fittest players I've ever played with were the mm. boys at Wimbledon. We were programmed, fit, great attitude, never say die. When we came together over that the white line before kick-off, we were together. Whatever happened off the field, Monday to Friday or Saturday night, didn't say. matter. Yeah. But against the odds, we were, we were going to win games of football and, and ultimately mate, win a trophy. When your mate gets the goal, which is a nice part of the story. But and he should have been there. After all that three hours training, Corky should have been there and not Sanch. Corky messed up. Corky still is bitter about it now. Alan Cork. I know who you mean. Yeah. Jack's. Yeah, Jack's, dad. Jack's dad, yeah. Corky was meant to be where Sanch was. I can remember it. I was edge of the box and I remember Sanch saying, Corky, yeah, go I, there, I, go I, there. You're now out of my comfort. You don't have to explain it. We had the in-swinging free kick. Yeah. And as I say, we trained for three hours and Corky still got it wrong. I don't know whether he thought he would use his experience because he was a clever player, Corky, and try something different. And Sanch was shouting. I remember Sanch shouting and Corky go like near, go exactly position. I'm trying to describe it, where Laurie scored from. Mm. That was meant to be Corky and Sanch was meant to be somewhere else. Sanch saw that F- Corky wasn't there. And thought, fill the space. I'm going to go, yeah, and then and gets a goal. <laughs> Some cocky still sets. Should have been me, <laughs> <laughs> and it should have been him, <laughs> and he would have done exactly the same because that was his speciality, wasn't it? Cocky, the, the <laughs> glancing header. There's a price for being a free spirit. <laughs> there is a price yeah, for being yeah. a free spirit. So that it should have been cocky. We're going to tie up by saying, you know, you spent the latter part of your um, your career here, and what stood out to for the minute I listened to you, what everybody's heard to do that clear organised football vision that you can you can translate into into phrases and words and some of that has been used by clubs who ask you to scout but you've seen also scouting you you lived in Spain for a little while where I think you did you know a bit of successful scouting as well but we I think we have views that are similar about the the way in which you should identify a footballer what research you should do about them how long you should spend watching them and then as opposed to giving them an Austin Allegro and leaving them at the training ground on their own. Yeah. Even today, there are equivalents of clubs who buy footballers without really knowing what to do with them and then just saying, well, we'll throw money at the buying and if we lose money, we'll just write that money off it. Have I hit on something? That's that, the that... problem. The money was too much money. So clubs don't have to be as diligent as they should be. In the Premier no, League, the we're Premier talking League, about principle. Yeah. We know that there are pockets yeah. of excellence everywhere in yeah. the Premier League across the scouting, but what do you see that, that, that ticks you off the most about the way in which players from La Liga, let's not call them solely Spanish players, but players no, from La exactly. Liga yeah. are, are bought or used or treated? A lot of it is agent-driven. Despite the clubs having these spectacular scouting networks that costs so much money, I still think there's an element of if an agent rings up about a player and he's got good contact connections with that club, they will still, despite all the reports that they've got from that player, still be driven by, well, we've used him in the past, he's recommended him, he's been, he must know. So I think there's, there should be, there's I, honestly, I really feel strongly that the, the scouting network regarding players from buying from other leagues in Europe is, is nowhere near what it should be. And that's purely because the, the money doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. There's so much money that it doesn't, it should matter to, you, you can't tell me clubs like in La Liga, like a Malaga and a Alaves, and they can't afford to lose money. Money is so tight, a bar. Every penny has to be well spent. Spot. So, and they won't get everyone, everything right because no. they, it doesn't work. Like, it, it, football is that nature. It's hit and miss. But you, you've got a better chance of hits if you put the work in and you convince the right people that this player is the right price, the right salary, the right position. We're not going to buy him and not play him. We're going to maximise him 
whether he cost them, I'm still hearing players going for 60,000 euros in La Liga or 400,000 euros for in La Liga. Whereas in England, I, I, in the Premier League, there is so much money, they can take a gamble on a player that someone said might be good. That's a euphemism. 15 million. Be, be sloppy on their preparation exactly. rather than just take a gamble. It's, uh, it's in some players, instances, it's sloppiness. Yeah, there's, and I, I speak to clubs from time to time and they're, they're asking an opinion about a player from a game, watching a game and stuff. And I'll say, yes, he's good. How much? And they'll go 20 million. And they go, no. And then you... Yeah, so well, let's say why you say no. Because in general, without naming that player or that club, it'll be... Double or maybe even treble the actual price that you know well, is his market value. Pay, yes, they'll end up paying twenty million for a player. That I, I probably, if they'd have said to me four or five, I might have said worth a game. Yeah, you know, worth worth you know looking at closely mm. if he's what you need. But then when it's twenty and fifteen, and uh, I could go through loads. Of, I mean, well, I'll, Lucas I'll, Perez, for example. Lucas is one of the ones I was going to go to for and sure. And he's done well at Arsenal when he's played. Yeah. He scored goals yeah. and he's looked the part. And even Arsenal fans... He, he, is, he is a good so footballer. He is. There's no question. But it, there were other clubs interested that weren't paid a buyout clause, that weren't, weren't going to get near the buyout clause. Clubs in the Premier League, clubs in La Liga that couldn't get anywhere near what clubs in the Premier League can pay. And no. Sevilla were meant to be interested, but they yeah. can't compete with... I think it was Leicester and, and West Brom were interested mm. in mm. Lucas Perez, Everton. And then Arsenal come out and blow them out of water by paying the the buyout clause and all the money that he wanted in salary, which is, my guess is about five or six times what he was earning at Depot. Yeah, oh. At least. At least. And now he's, a year later, he's back at the same club. On loan, with Depot paying a fraction of the wages that Arsenal So let's paid. name, the, of the three parties, let's name the two winners. Lucas Perez and Deportivo La Coruña. It's, but, yeah. And the loser is Arsenal, but it doesn't, but your point is emphasized, and, and that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it, it's... And well, that's... What, what, what's the about 18 million. Tra let's transfer that to, for example, a player who's not identical, but plays in the same position, Borja Bastón. Yeah. Who was looking, you know, a solid, reliable, hard-working uh, footballer in La Liga. On and loan at Eibar from mm, Atletico Madrid. Mm. Scored goals in the second division with Zaragoza and Depor. Goes to Eibar. He, he, he did really well. Very well. 15, 18 goals. Well, they have a record lower. season, just like Alaves would, you know, a couple yeah. of seasons later. And, and he's one of the principal architects. And again, he went for, was it, about £18 million again? And, so uh, Swansea. And now? I saw him playing wide right under Bob Bradley. And now he's on loan at Malaga, mm. confidence torn to shreds. Mm. And, and that was paid on the back of a, one, a player having one solid season. Not two, one in the top division. And then now he's back at Malaga on loan again, the same scenario. Malaga paying a fraction of his wages. He's not getting a game at Malaga. What is, what is going to happen? This isn't just me picking on Swansea or Arsenal. These are two instances. This, is, this goes on in so many players and clubs. So having worked in La Liga... And no, one, no, one, no one bothers me. Well, let's. We are. We're getting flippant towards 18 million and 20 yeah. million on a transfer. And yeah. Oh, he's on 60 grand a week. He's on loan at... Malaga, I'll use that as an example, they're paying 25% of his wages. We've got another four years of that. No one seems to, because there is so much and people expect there still to be so much. So it's, And then Premier League clubs wonder why they get striped up when it comes to a fee. You know? Because everybody because, sees them coming. Exactly. And it, you lived and worked in Andalusia and you know, you know where I'm going to go. But I mean, ha having watched the development of Sevilla, as a resident around there and and then as a an analyst for Sky, Monchi's name must be, you know, the template of exactly the opposite of what you're talking about. One. And two, you know, why why aren't you doing that for a Premier League club? I'm not sure I would the director of football role, but in terms of being more of an assistant with particularly players in Spain, I'm surprised Clubs, more clubs haven't tapped into that. Yeah, I'm sure. But Munchie is the, the perfect example. He, he's ex player and a goalkeeper that's worked his way through at Sevilla. His transfer record is second to none. Mm. I was fortunate enough, as part of my pro licence coaching qualification, I went and did a little stay in Sevilla and shadowed him for two or three days and his staff. At that time, this was the time when they were in the, the UEFA Cups the first time around. 
they spent less on their scouting than Coventry City did in the Championship. And they were getting Danny Elvis for 400,000 euros and selling him for 20, was it? Well, uh, I think the rest, I think so 30. Baptista, 30. Julio Baptista. Julio Baptista was 20. A million no. to 20 in exactly. that time. Then when everyone thought it was going to fall apart with the money they got from Baptista, they improved it with Fabiano and Canuti and still made about seven or eight million profit on buying those two players as yeah. compared to Baptista. The, the, the vision of bringing up youth players and encouraging the manager, almost to the extent that they tell him, is that's what he's got to do. Mm. You know, it, it was Caparos at the time, Joaquin Caparos and Ed Navas and Sergio Ramos. And it was, no, we're not buying you another right winger and a right back because you're going to... Promote them, use them. Yes, and with his agreement and encouragement that it was something that he wanted to do, he did it, and look where those two players ended up. So I love what I do for Sky. I've got no inclination to do anything different, but that is in terms of going back into coaching or managing... But that that would be something I'd, I'd love to get my tape stuck into. In That's why I mention it, because I, I, I know how good you are, how valuable you are, but the, a club doesn't see that in you, strikes me, as been beyond obtuse. Yeah. But then the last word goes to a phrase you used about develop youth, and you know you are a European champion. It's a huge achievement. Under 18s. Yeah, kind of, it is, and was, I can't forget about Against it. Poland, England, Poland. Who, who got... Who, who got the winner in, yeah, in, yeah. In, in, in the final? Yeah. Go on, say uh, it. Diving header from about... Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. 12 inches off Free the floor. Wimbledon, so not Free invented Wimbledon. by yeah, Wimbledon. No, 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 it was, it was about 12 inches off the floor. <laughs> Last minute, extra time on that, come on as a sub. Yeah, and it was not something I often think about and didn't. I've still got the medal and, I still, and every time you see it, you think, oh, yeah. European we champion. Didn't. European, we beat Holland in the semi-final. Throw in some names. Hullet, Rijkaard. Yeah. Um, That'll do. But our, our team, we had Paul Allen, who just won the FA Cup with West Ham. Right. So he was 17. Yeah. He turned up late to our training camp. Having He'd just been, been playing, at playing at Wembley in the FA Cup final. Every single one of us at the under-18 level were first-team regulars. Sure. I wasn't a regular, sorry. I played first-team yeah. football for Spurs, hence why I was sub. Our front two was Mark Aitley and Tommy English, who were both first-choice strikers at Coventry. Gary Mabber, Mabber. Andy Peake was at Leicester. Steve McKenzie, probably Palace at the time still. Because his, his big City. feet took him to City, didn't he? Yeah, Tommy Caton, Colin Pates, Paul Walsh. It was, it was ridiculous. When you look back, we were all... For, but, but you now know the reason I'm asking, because you know you don't have the yes, it will happen, but we've seen a blend of everything that you've been watching in the last yeah. decade and a half. And we share a love of Spanish football, but... You've got a bigger love still than, than I would have of English. Well, I'm thrilled about what's yeah. happening because I'd just like to see an end to stupidity, a broadening of horizons, skill in England. I'm tired of the cliched story, even as a Scot, of yeah. England yeah. waltzing through a qualification, yeah. expectations built and up. And another generation that. I is. want them to punch their weight. I yeah. want there, there to be another big nation that can go and win a tournament because I want to see why. I want to. It'll, it'll fascinate yeah. me. But. So what we watched, I had Spain 2-0 up, yeah. and England win 5-2, their second World Cup triumph. You know, the logic says that it is one of the ways for the Premier League to stop spending badly and throwing money at Spain. Yeah. One of the drivers, accelerants, has to be pick the players, use the players. That, that is the, it's the bottom use line. Them. As I said, when we were under 18s, we were already playing first-team football. Now, it's going to be fascinating to see where these youngsters are going to get first-team opportunities. Yet yeah, some of them are going to have to go on loan when they're out of youth football. I do, I do watch quite a bit of the under-23, the Premier League, to reserve football. It, it's a nonsense. They don't play enough games. It's not competitive. So when Pep um, Guardiola last May said, in response to a question from the floor in a press conference, you know, have you got kids coming through? And he went, well, we do. But, you know, there's no pressure. They don't learn. It's impossible for them to make the gap. Yeah. It's not about their quality. It's about the, the rubbish league that they're playing in. You, yeah, there's yeah, no yeah. impetus. And it, it, it's a phrase you used about reserve football. There's no, you know, you said, I hated reserve football because it was no pressure. Yeah. Well, that's been reproduced in this under-23 league, right? And I'm, I'm looking at some of the players. I do some work for Manchester United for their TV channel and go and co-commentate. And some of the players, I'm writing down 21, 22 years of age. And then I'm seeing... The next game, I'm doing a game the next day in the league and run Sal, 
22. Yeah. He's not Champions League final, so many caps. And yet we, we, I'm calling these younger players, the last game I did was Manchester United, West Ham, and young players, and then they're not. And then I go back to when I was an under 18 youth international, and we were all first team players. Alex Williams was the goalkeeper, who was playing at Manchester City. It was important positions, it was regular players playing at. So it, it's crucial to see how these youngsters, where they get playing opportunities. The one thing I would say on this subject, though, is that I've banged on for years about the Spanish progression, about wanting to play, the, the, the national teams having the power to play the players they want mm -hmm. and getting used to winning tournaments at different mm -hmm. age groups. So the next stage for me is the under-21s. Instead of, the, when, when the next tournament comes around, I know there's always going to be one or two issues, but we, we never have our strongest under-21 team available to win the under-21s. Spain traditionally do, don't they? They do, they, but... They you, go from... So you'd rather... They would the, step back from full team, the, the full international, in the summer, they would go and play in the under-21s, win that tournament, and then six, eight years later, they're playing the same players against the same it's players. True. It's true. When they're 24, but, but 25, I, and I, they think... Well, we beat them in that tournament. It's just, it does work like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, look, 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 look. Your, your example is that you know, eighty-five percent of the Spain team and eighty-five percent of the England team in Kolkata had played each other in Poland yeah. a year before. Yeah. Spain had snuck it and, and yeah. you know had won. So the England players had a taste of defeat, but it was damn close. Yeah. Penalties and a, a six-minute of extra time equaliser. And then that group played up again and they went and, you know, apart from the skill and apart from the fact that we, we saw different England players yeah. that, that yes. moved differently, passed differently, with a different Style attitude, play. technical touch on the ball, but still taller and more physical, yeah. all the things that used to be impo important elements of an English football. Oh, now they've got the things that the Spanish players have too and that's dynamite, that's pure yeah. dynamite. But they also knew up here... There's no difference between us and them from no. a year ago. They lifted the trophy, but, they, you know, it's a yeah. ball here. There's nothing. Yeah. So that thing that, about playing definitely. each other in six years, five, those two groups will be playing each yeah. other right now well, until, exactly. until we retire. Yeah. But the, the, the crucial element, of course, is where they're going to play, these players. Won this tournament. Are they going to be playing on loan in the lower divisions? Are they going to be playing in the under-23 league? Are they going to be playing championship level, Premier League level? Let's make a deal to get well, out they of the... Are the first teams of the club that they belong to? The Terry Gibson story, the abridged version, the funny version, the happy version, the winning version, which is what this has been. Let's make a pact to get out of this podcast so that you yep. can go to the theatre. <laughs> Let's make a noise, you and I, mutually, in every communication medium that's available to us about why these youngsters should be trusted and played now. And it's not up to the youngsters, having shown this quality this far to show that they're Maradonas over the next six months so that they get a chance. They only flourish if they're given a chance. They only exactly. learn if they're given a chance. Exactly. The, the onus is on the clubs now, not on the players. No, the clubs can't I say, agree totally. come on, players, you... you. Now, if you just give us another nudge, it'll be... Yeah. Oh, no, nah, it's, on, yeah. it's on the clubs, right? Exactly, 100%. And totally you and I are going to make a noise Don't keep that. buying numbers to clog up. There has to be a programme. There has to be a procedure where they know of the player. So he's a left-back. He's 18, 19... So if we're going to buy a left back for next season, let's make sure he's 28, 29, 30. We don't go out and spend 20 million on a 21-year-old, 22-year-old, because in two years' time, he's going to be Our out. kid shadows him and then plays six there is times, no then plays 12 times, then plays 25 times, exactly. and then plays 40 he times. He trains with the first team, yeah. plays in pre-season, travels with a squad. Pochettino, on a happy note, that's what he does at Spurs. There's been a Harry Winks. There was a programme for Harry Kane, for Harry Winks. Harry Winks is playing regular now, but a year, 18 months ago, he was getting a game off the bench. He was then trusted in big games when it was a bit of a surprise. That's, that's the pro, that is the method, that is a programme. And Spurs are lucky, we start right the way back at the beginning, that we have a manager that is prepared to have that programme and to, you know, not... He doesn't need encouragement to do it. He knows the value of young players coming through and having that programme in place and eventually Harry Kane being worth £200 million. It's an asset to the club. It's an asset to the supporters. And it, it's, it's smashing that there, is, there are some managers that do have that, that vision.
Professor Doctor <laughs> Terence Gibson, you've just saved English football and <laughs> no, trumped me by getting a mention of Spurs in, <laughs> exactly. in order to get out of the big interview with Terry Gibson. Terry Gibson, Spurs are on their way to Wembley. Yes, on a weekly basis. At the Tottenham moment. are going to do yeah. it again. <laughs> Cheers, what an man. absolute joy, my friend. A, a privilege. No, no, uh, my what, pleasure. What a fabulous football career. What well. a right good football mind you've got. Talk for him. Talk for him. <laughs> now. Begin of you fans, share some love with Terry Gibson. <laughs> the Big Interview is produced by Backpage and me, Graham Hunter. The music you always hear, the music that you love, is Beer Jacket. You can keep up with everything that we do within reason by getting on the mailing list at grahamhunter.tv how many times do I have to tell you yes several thousand of you have done it but come on slackers at the back sign up that grahamhunter.tv site is also where you can buy the new updated version of my book Barca the making of the greatest team in the world it's my account of the Guardiola era at the camp now from 2008 until 2012 plus Tito Tata and adios Johan Cruyff. It is in all good bookshops now, but it does also make a big difference to all of us who've worked on the project if you choose to buy direct at grahamhunter.tv forward slash books. You'll be sure to get the new edition and you will be helping us to continue producing independent content. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being there. Without you, this would be fun, but a lot less fun. See you soon.